So I'm going to share my screen with you guys so you guys have access to the PowerPoint. Okay, everybody should be able to see it, hopefully. Uh, can everybody see everything? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, so just to kind of, uh, I don't know who all was here last week, we've had quite a few people interested in lecture live. So these past two lecture lives, we've been learning about Michelangelo. Well, now we're going to, um, we're going to take a deep dive into the future, into an artist that's very different from Michelangelo. So Andy Warhol is kind of synonymous with the idea of, he's who you really consider when you think of contemporary art, pop art, and all of that stuff. But a lot of ideologies and concepts behind pop art and contemporary art are, are kind of difficult to grasp. And so if you guys know and have read more, you know, read books about Andy Warhol, you would probably know uh, more than most people and definitely more than I do, you know. Uh, so I went to a, like kind of a deep dive to get all of this research out so we can kind of learn about this artist and why he was important to contemporary art and how he kind of diverged from our classical understanding of art. But do understand that to jump from Michelangelo, who's active in the 16th century, and then to jump to Andy, uh, we are, that's a, an expanse of a lot of different art movements and a lot of different uh, societies, cultures, all this stuff. And so just keep that in mind, but we are going to also see some similarities between uh, what Andy is doing and some of the concepts that Michelangelo came up with. So. I titled this What is Crazy because when we think about um, a crazy artist and definitely a celebrity artist, we really do think about Andy Warhol. He was actually friends with a lot of major celebrities. All of the Marilyn paintings that we have or prints that we have are probably from Andy Warhol. So, so here's a big hello and a basic introduction crash course to contemporary art. So like I said, many people struggle with the concepts of contemporary art because it really stems from postmodern ideological thought. And that's just a fancy term for saying that there it's highly based in relativism. So there's no overt standard that contemporary art is having to adhere to, right? So it's not this um, enlightenment or it's not kind of what was happening in the Renaissance with you know, neoclassicism and all these movements, postmodernism, we're living in a postmodern world now, is primarily defined by relativism. It's what people want to do, pretty much, and nobody can tell them otherwise. So it also proves an intriguing commentary on recent history and contemporary cultural movements. So contemporary art can still be studied because it is a record of the history that's happening now, pretty much. So it's recording the now, which, you know, tomorrow will become history. And so there is some stuff that historians can do with contemporary art, but also understand that contemporary art is kind of always evolving, especially now in the time that we live where social media is so prevalent and it's so easy to be in contact with all sorts of other cultures and movements and languages. The contemporary art scene is always shifting somewhat. Um, what's really difficult, what's somewhat difficult about it is that it, it rejects expectations about aesthetic qualities and a need for originality. So we're going to go over this a little deeper in what Warhol and a lot of other pop artists were doing, but they were kind of going against the status quo of earlier examples of abstract expressionism that was kind of stemming from this post-war period. So they're kind of shoving that in the face and that was very original, you know, think of, think of a little bit of a Jackson Pollock and all of these major abstract artists that we know that was like, oh, we need to be original, we need to be individual, this is a whole new movement. Pop artists were also contemporary artists, but they were like, no, we don't really care about that, we're going to actually make fun of it. So, it's a difficult concept because the art exists beyond the object itself, and if I haven't lost you yet, it will start to become a bit more clear as we dive into it. So this week, we're looking at pop art specifically, which can be interpreted in one of two ways, or both, if that's your thing. Like I said, we live in a postmodern world. It can simultaneously mean both things. It can mean something different, depending on how people approach it. But historians have pretty much categorized pop art into meaning one of two things. 
One, the style glorifies popular culture. So it's a type of the revival of the mundane. It's looking at what's around us and interpreting it as this is our beautiful. This is how we see our world now in a creative way. Or two, it functions as a critique of mass marketing and consumer practices. Now it's a big deal in the contemporary art world to critique social issues, just like it's always been popular to critique the society around us, right? So even in the Italian Renaissance, even in the French Impressionism, or even in French Impressionism, even in American Impressionism, there was an idea that there were some type of social critiques at play in their art. Uh, this is overtly poking fun at it. So this is kind of how pop art varies or you know diverges from earlier movements. So, so pop art is really a gift from the 50s. There are people that uh, argue that it really started with French artist Marcel Duchamp. Now he was, he was the artist that was known for uh, taking a toilet urinal and signing his name and calling it art. Okay, uh, and that's, and he said, no, I, I get to say what is art. I get to say we, and nobody really gets to define it except for the artist or the creator of such things himself. Of course, that was also a play on like, can it, can it be mine? Is anything really mine? Can it be mine if I sign my name? So a lot of things were happening when Duchamp was practicing his craft. Um, but pop art, the style, really originated from the 40s to the mid 50s. Uh, Duchamp's theory was, and Duchamp was a very postmodern artist, so his theory was built on a postmodern thought, and he said pretty much as something was art, it was as such. In the 1950s, artists began to build on this foundation, so they built, built on this earlier concept, challenging the boundaries of distinguishing art from real life. And so they want to go against the status quo of like, well, what is fine art? You know, can it only be painting? Can it only be sculpture? Can it only be watercolor? You know, what can, what can we do with this here? Their response was very much a reaction to the earlier movement, like I said, abstract expressionism, which held to lofty ideologies of abstraction and individualism and still worked within the framework of traditional and fine art. Now, to say that they were only going against abstraction or abstract expressionism is probably not true. We know that all throughout history, whether it be the Impressionists or the early modernists, we know that there were artists that went against the status quo here. So this is not anything new, right? Going against the earlier movement. You know, even, even what Michelangelo was doing, he was going against the earlier movement found in Byzantine art or medieval art. So this is not necessarily a new, this is not a, pop artists like to think of themselves as somewhat original. There's a vein of originality there that we're making fun, but that's not really true because it's been done before because it's hard to not do things that have been done before in history. But they were going directly against abstract expressionism because that was the closest movement that adhered to this new fine art concept and standard. So. Not only this, post-war consumerism was a big push for these artists as well. So we can think about this post-war aspect that it brought in new technologies. There were new areas of wealth for these people. So we had a lot of mass productions, right? We had things that made certain things either, whether it was washing machines or canned goods or pre-mixed foods, you know, there were a lot of mass production in specifically in areas of food, but in other areas of technology as well. So at the time, everything was being mass produced and each product really promised happiness with its use while emphasizing the copious amount of free time one would have. Now that they don't have to worry about this, right? You don't have to hang dry your stuff now. We've got a dryer. You don't have to do all of these things. You don't have to hand wash your clothes. You don't have to, you don't have to make everything in dinner. You don't have to make the cake mix itself. Now you can get it in a box. And so it promised their, their, who they were advertising to, uh, their consumers, that there was happiness, more happiness to be found in all the free time and with the stuff that you can buy. So artists then took this idea and began to shift from painting towards more industrial techniques such as silk screens, photography, earth art, et cetera. So artists started working in new media as well. They started shifting away from traditional, traditional painting and sculpture because they really wanted to dig into 
what was their culture doing right now? You know, what are all these cultural shifts happening? We see all these new things being created. Can we create something else? So, boom, here comes Andy Warhol. So, introduce you to the man, the myth, and the legend. Born in Pittsburgh to a working class immigrant family, he was very much involved in contemporary American life. So he didn't have this, you know, he didn't have this weird, when people think of Andy Warhol, they think of like this super creative guy, kind of a weirdo from the offset. He had a relatively normal childhood. A lot of people were actually immigrants at the time because the war had displaced a lot of people. And there were a lot, there was quite a bit of immigration happening, you know, broad scale globalization. The world was at peace. Here we go. Boom. So he had a relatively normal uh, working class upbringing. So during a childhood illness that often left him bedridden, he would listen to the radio, which often included information about celebrities. Warhol himself claimed this was very important to his early development and interest. Now we do the same thing, except that we just don't really listen to the radio about celebrities anymore. Instead, we consume all of the media that they put out, whether it's TV shows or movies or podcasts, but we listen to all of these people. We still are very much consuming the celebrity culture at large. Now, today there are a lot of frustrations with celebrity culture, but we still kind of consume people that are, let's say, larger than life. Andy Warhol did the same thing, and it just so happened to stick with him throughout his life. So he eventually went on to become infatuated with the arts, and then he chose to study commercial art in college. Andy became a successful commercial illustrator and eventually went on to exhibit some of his earlier work. And this is usually how artists get their start. They usually have a smaller exhibition. People tend to like it. Then they kind of go on and or experiment outside of their professional area. Same thing with Andy. He started out, he wasn't always the man, the myth, and the legend, right? Just like Michelangelo wasn't always this great early artistic genius, but they started out just as normal people do. So, um, he was set on emerging into the fine art world. So after he had exhibited some of his work, he wanted to be involved full time in the art world. All right. And begin creating advertisements for products as art rather than art for advertisements. And so this is a big deal in Andy's work is that he created things, objects, advertisements that were art in themselves instead of creating it specifically for an advertisement. So what deviates his work from what we would see in grocery stores? Well, it was the concept and the mass media behind it, right? It was the process behind it. So just like Jackson Pollock, which he would be frightened that we compared him to, it was really more about this process behind creation. So. When he first began, he used rubber stamps, but eventually worked his way into silk screening. You know, he was, he was experimenting when, with how to mass produce his own work. How can I produce more and more stuff, even though I'm just one guy, one artist? So he was always curious how to mass produce art himself, which really mirrored the culture he lived in, right? So we talked about all this mass production was happening, the landscape of America in the 60s, 70s, 80s that it was starting to shift, right? So he was curious how he would fit into and relate to the culture that he was in. A unique perspective he had on the issue was that in America, both the rich and the poor essentially bought the same stuff, such as Coca-Cola and soup, right? So there were things that were the great equalizers between social stratas in American life, and partly, and a lot of that was what we consumed. So. Now, this is, this is one of his prints from the famous Campbell Soup mural. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but um, Andy saw his subjects as a common language for all people. Everybody got to eat and drink. So Warhol eventually created his well-known factory, which was his studio, but he called it a factory, and set to work with his assistants, rolling out product after product, much like the warehouses would do with their products. So you need to understand that Andy was serious in mirroring his culture, and he was serious in blurring these lines between real life and fine art. He wanted to experiment here. He liked the ambiguity, and he liked that there were no set standards here. This was an area that he could experiment himself. So remember that in contemporary art, the lines between fine art and the daily life or the normal are often blurred. We actually see that today. 
um, that people will go in and they'll take, you know, these gorgeous photographs of cityscapes and city streets, or they'll intentionally make a photograph maybe more gritty, right? More realistic, more, more, maybe even potentially ugly in order to express the realities around them. So we still are working with these same ideas. They're just put in different visualizations. So I also said, can you believe this soup can is worth tons of money? And the name behind it worth even more. We'll learn that Andy was also interested in marketing himself too, as we learn a little bit more about his life. Andy began to explore and force his way into the pop art world with an emphasis on abundance rather than individualism. So this is why his soup cans, why he has so many in one, one work, right? One print here. So he is more focused on cranking out a large number than something that is like, oh, so detailed and individualistic that I can just really study. Um, he's working with a new set of concepts here. So individualism was something that pop artists fought against with their work as it was part, like I said, of abstract expressionist philosophy. Warhol wanted to focus on what was happening in the current culture where people came together to get a product on the market. So he was very interesting in market. He was very interested in marketing techniques. Like I said, he studied commercial art in college. He knew all of these things. He knew how to mass market. He knew what went into marketing and he knew what consumers wanted, right? And so it's kind of, he took all of these things that he had learned and he applied them specifically to his art or his creations. Now, understand that art has not, not always been so individualistic. We've actually gone back. A lot of our contemporary artists today are really big on individualism. Uh, there is all, there's always a set of artists though, contemporary artists, you can't, you can't ever just classify them as one group, but there is this understanding that yes, you know, we have copyright laws now, there are individual creations that I need to make that are mine specifically. And so we've always got to consider, but there are always outliers in the contemporary art world. So, but, so let's consider the Italian Renaissance, Michelangelo, how he trained is by directly copying other artists work. That's how he got better. Um, those were the, that was the art around at the time. And so he had to use it in order to learn. Um, so art has not always been so individualistic. Uh, art has not always had a name attributed to it. Michelangelo actually only signed a few of his works. Um, so, I'll, so know that, you know, there are definitely trends that have come and gone and shifted and, and they return. And so Andy is working against this individualistic notion because of abstract expressionism, which was the movement that came before. So let's move on to kind of his human subjects because we know that Andy is famous for obviously Prince. He's famous for a lot of his Maryland depictions. Um, so let's see how they fare next to him, next to his consumer products. So many of Warhol's images came from newspapers, publicity stills and magazines. And uh, what do we know about these? You know, we know that newspapers, publicity stills and magazines don't always have the highest, uh, clarity or the highest value in their pictures, right? Like, you know, they're, and sometimes they're intentionally depicted as more grotesque than they actually are, depending on what magazine you're buying about whatever celebrity. So usually in taking his images from these things, he was making a shrewd commentary on the celebrity as commodity. And so this was another angle of kind of our consumer culture. We don't just consume what we eat, what we drink, the technology that we buy. We also, cons we also consume people to where they become to us just flat, uh, shallow shells of humans because we nitpick their very lives. And so it was a very shrewd commentary on consumer culture, to, um, cons uh, specifically with celebrities. So his New York studio, in fact, became a popular gathering place for intellectuals, Hollywood celebrities, wealthy patrons, and more. He actually used to take, you know, traveling bohemian types just off the street and invite them into his studio. So he didn't just, he didn't just meld with, you know, kind of the upper echelons of the social strata as we know it, but he also was interested in kind of these working class people, right? He was interested in people just surrounding his area. He was interested in people that performed on the streets and other artisans and creatives. So he wasn't a snob. 
his specific commentary alluded to the idea of abundance within celebrity culture. The phrase 15 minutes of fame was likely coined by Warhol, who famously said, in the future, everybody will be famous for 15 minutes. And if only Andy could see us today, because that is very true. We, we know people that have gotten famous on Instagram. We know that now TikTok, you can be famous on this video app that all of these kids and all of these you know younger adults are using um and you can become famous on these apps without actually becoming famous famous right but you can become well known with thousands of followers because of what the social because of what social media has done and andy predicted that you know this is where our culture was going that everybody would have this taste of being kind of a commodity whether it's helped us or hindered our culture i'll let you all decide like products, celebrities and those of a high social status were watched obsessively with their lives open to the public for consumption. So this idea of consumer culture plays in almost every aspect of Andy's life. This was, this was the big deal. This is, this is why he did what he did. And it wasn't always a critique. We know that Andy's, that a lot of Andy's work is you know, kind of beautiful and it's fun and it's lively and you can interact with it. But at the same time, it also functions as a critique of what was happening in the culture. So what were his subjects you asked? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you for free. So his subjects were obviously products. There are many recurring themes in Warhol's work, such as products, money, celebrity, shoes, rich people himself and death. Uh, these were not just Warhol's obsessions, but were deeply reflective of the culture at the time. And so it's pretty important that as much as we try, we can't quite ever divorce ourselves from what the culture around us is doing. We're very much a product of our culture, you know. And so when people talk about products of culture or cultural bias, that's kind of what they're talking about. And so I live in Oklahoma. You all probably live in Arkansas. You may live somewhere else but we are still culture, we are still products of the cultures around us, right? We have to fit into the social norms, essentially, to do what we want to do. Um, and although those, those may be, you know, relaxing a little bit, we're still very much products of our time. And Andy was no different. And neither were, was any other artist of their own time, you know? There's always a cultural stream, even in the artists that think that they're rebelling against the status quo. They can't quite get rid of the cultural bias. Um, his work charts the development of our obsession with fame as well. You know, everybody was obsessed with it. Uh, everybody is obsessed with it today. You know, you, you meet a lot of kids, well, what do you want to do? And you may have the normal doctors and astronauts and all that stuff, but you also get a lot of kids that are like, oh, I want to be a singer. I want to be a dancer. I want to be famous. I want to be an actress. Um, it was the same thing. It was the same thing happening during Andy's time as well. Uh, and fun fact, Andy liked messing around with shoes and so there are quite a few you know silk screens and, and prints featuring shoes rich people that we've kind of gone over you know you saw a picture of prince we're going to see further in our discussion and pictures and depictions of maryland and money so warhol was questioning the growing commercialization and uniformity happening in areas of american life and he wanted to go against this notion of individuality, but he also understood that people were also losing their individual individuality too. You know, people were starting to work in factories, people were starting to work under hotshot CEOs, they were going to study law, they were becoming doctors. Everybody was essentially to Andy, kind of seeming to become the same. Um, remember a lot of contemporary art has to do with the critique of current culture, social movements and more. So we know that this is what Andy was doing. Warhol's work was no different, and it was very much a product, like I said, of his time. So, Warhol the businessman, this is kind of how Andy became Andy Warhol. Um, he was actually very ast a very astute businessman that had his hands kind of in every aspect of life, and he formed his first corporate entity, Andy Warhol Enterprises, no surprise, in 1957. He also never stopped working for hire. So even the older he got, people could hire him to ver do various, you know, portraits, various commissions, all this stuff. So he made thousands of commissioned portraits for patrons. And by 1970, commissioned portraits were a solid chunk of Andy's income. So he knew what he was good at and he never stopped doing it pretty much. Anyone could have their portrait made for the low price of 25,000 bucks. 
So I know that you guys would love to hop on that. That's what I do. I mean, I, I look for artists that will make my portrait for $25,000 because I just have that money to spend. So along with his portraits, but remember, Warhol hung out with a lot of celebrities. So was it a lot? Probably not. Along with his own portraits, Warhol was eager to trade on his own image, creating numerous self-portraits and offering opportunity for endorsements. So this is what I said. This is when I said that Andy marketed himself and he commercialized on himself as well. He commercialized and made himself out of his own image. So Warhol wasn't just an artist, but a filmmaker, band manager, magazine publisher, and television producer. So like I said, he was, very, he was a very creative guy. He was interested in a lot of areas of creative expression, and he was very successful at it. You know, he, had a, he, was, he was obviously an artist, and he had a good eye for this stuff. He is also known for fearlessly exploring opportunities given by new media. So it didn't bother him, you know, if there were new trends in photography, new trends in film, um, if there was something else out there, you know, even earth art or some various form of sculpture, Andy was always interested in that because it was something new, right? It was coming on the market. It was something new, it was something for him to experience with or sp experiment with. And that's really how he made a name for himself and was so prolific of an artist as well because he was just interested in a lot of things. And this kind of has a ring to it in terms of Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, they were known as their, like your stereotypical Renaissance man, right? They were interested in a lot of things. They were interested in math, science, uh, theology, th um, anatomy, you know, they were interested in biology, you know, engineering, you know, they did everything. And Andy is still working in that vein of these artists that are interested in other areas besides their own creative expression, aside from their own creative expression. So he understood to be an artist in an economy, you had to step up and be all business-like. Um, he wanted to make a professional career about being an artist and he knew that he had to work within the business sector as it was, which deviates from kind of a, what some contemporary artists do today. Some contemporary artists feel that, oh, their art should stand as a testament to what the fine art world is now. And they feel like they don't have to engage in lowly endeavors such as business. You know, they, they shouldn't have to market themselves so much. Their art should stand alone, but that's not necessarily true. Andy knew in order to be successful and to get his art out in the world, he had to work with the world as it was. So not only was Andy kind of in this vein a dreamer, but he was very, a star he was very much a stark realist as well. So this led Andy turning himself into a globally recognized brand. Of course, a lot of people called him a sellout. Like I said, there were a lot of people that said, no, your art belongs in the art world, but you're selling yourself out to these businesses, whatever. But by exploring the relationship between commerce and art, Warhol nullified the very idea of a sellout. And that's pretty much saying, well, you call me a sellout, but am I really, if I'm being able to put my art here and people can see it here because I've, because I've worked with commerce and worked with how the world works. You know, why does that make me a sellout? And in a postmodern world, definitions are definitions. So if I define a sellout as somebody that actually works with somebody, can you, can you really be a sellout? So he was working with these concepts and ideologies. You know, is there truth? Is it relativism? Is, is it all relativistic? And so that, so he kind of nullified this idea that, no, nah, I don't think I'm actually a sellout. So, but Sam, is it art? Now we've studied, and we're gonna to continue to study major artists throughout history, but, you know, coming off of Michelangelo, you know, a Campbell's soup can <laughs> is much different from, let's say, the Sistine Chapel or the creation of Adam or the Last Judgment, but very different. And so how can these two things be art? Well, let's go over it. This image is from a larger collection of a work titled Campbell's Soup Cans from 1962. But what makes it art? What if we just saw this in a grocery store or a marketing department? So I'm going to open it up to you and I want you guys to tell me why you think this is or isn't art. So I'm going to mute my mic and you just speak it if you want to. If nobody wants to, then we will keep going. I can't help but to look at it as marketing. I mean, I like it, but I, I don't know if I would consider it true art. 
as as much as just capitalizing on something, marketing something. Yeah, and a lot of people feel that way. And this is where Andy actually likes and prefers to work. He likes working in this ambiguity of people trying to figure out whether his art is actually art. And he wants to blur that line of, well, is anything that I create considered art? So just know that Andy likes working in this type of ambiguity. And what you're saying makes complete and total sense and is a completely valid point <laughs> as well. So. Okay, if nobody else has anything to say, we'll just keep pushing it. We'll just keep going. Okay. So one reason that many people and that we would consider this art is because of its location within a museum. Now there are a lot of art historians, critical theorists that, or theorists, art, art theory, art theorists, right? Yeah, that um, have written about this fact, like when you put something in a museum, does that actually make it art? You know, I think the MoMA has actually been in the papers these past few years because they've taken stuff like off the street and put it in a museum. And they said, oh, it's art, see, because I put it in a museum. So a big reason a lot of people consider Andy's work is because it, it's in a museum. So being placed in a museum encourages the viewer to think about what they're really seeing. So if we took, say, a sign in Walmart that was marketing Campbell's Soup and placed it in a museum, well, now people are gonna come look at it and they're gonna stare in front of it and try to figure out what it means. Well, does that define something as art? So this is an aspect of modern and contemporary art is to transform something into something else. So can I take something that's even be, been pre-made, take it, I possess it now and transform it into something else without actually ruining the integrity of what was created in the first place. So another aspect is the cult, in, this, in the culture that this art was born into is that, and, and Andy just, well, hello. Andy just so happened to live in a time where people considered this art. So this was another reason, right? That people in the time that Andy was working primarily were considering different things, different art forms art, right? They weren't just considering stuff from Michelangelo as art. They weren't considering only impressionistic works as art. Um, and we know that this is true because when the, when Van Gogh tried to, you know, put his stuff out there and say like, no, this is art. A lot of people just laughed in his face because they considered it trash pretty much. So Andy just so happened to live in a time where this was considered art. And so as people now living now, you know, 60 years later, we have to also say, well, this was also a product of its time. And so we would call this art potentially because other people in the past considered it as such. So 50 years before Andy showed up and if say 50 years before he was born, if he did this, if somebody did this, they would have been thought insane. And today they would just be considered a derivative, right? Or a copycat artist pretty much. So now if pop artists come out and say like, look what I've done. Now we just say, oh, that's just Roy Lichtenstein. That's just Andy Warhol. That's just the pop artist. Like those aren't art for, you know, that's not really art anymore because we live in a different time period where it's different, you know, cultural expectations are different. So, so when we're considering if something is art, we always have to consider the location of where it is, which isn't always fair, but it does play a big part in what is considered art and the culture that that art was born into. So Warhol essentially asked, you know, what's the import, what's important and significant about our cultural now in an industrial society rather than just an agricultural one? You know, he was looking at in the industrial society for the first time and really saying like, well, what does this mean for our art, for what we create for our daily lives? And there were other artists that came before him, you know, pre-war that also were lamenting and, and some were, you know, some were embracing the industrial society around them too. So he wasn't focusing on the making of something or the style, but he was refocusing the ideas of how we approach them. So it wasn't that he did something technically profound, right? Because honestly, a lot of people could do this. You know, a lot of artists today could do these things. Uh, but he was looking at the world in a certain way, asking, can this be art too? 
So Warhol reflects on the way that we manufacture or construct our world. There was always a deeper symbolism in Warhol's work that I think sometimes can be lost in maybe the perceived shallowness of what we're seeing. But even today, most of our stuff is made in a factory and his art symbolized that. And he used stamps for the design of the body. And, and fun fact about this art can is that he used stamps right here at the bottom because he didn't feel like painting it. <laughs> so he got some stamps made and was like, I'll just put some paint on these stamps and stamp it. You know, so he was really interested in the process of creating, not just creating or not just the painting itself. So Warhol was looking for subject matter completely outside the scope of fine art. And that's kind of where we get his genius from. So now we're moving on to a little bit of Maryland because we can't have anything about Andy Warhol without a little bit of Maryland happening. So Warhol's Gold Maryland is located in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The entire room is dedicated solely to pop art. So this room is obviously like stepping into a time capsule of when Andy Lichtenstein and all of these pop artists were working. Uh, most of the canvas is covered in a metallic gold paint with a floating head of Marilyn Monroe at the center, and it was created in 1962. The actual photo was the last photo session Marilyn vetted and approved before her death. And her floating head isn't a painting at all, but it's actually a print. So that kind of gives it a little bit deeper of a sense of value and worth. You know, this is the last photo that we really have of Marilyn Monroe approving before she died. You know, this was Marilyn as she saw herself, essentially. So the print was from a photograph featured in a newspaper, so it wasn't very high quality, and Warhol has enlarged the image significantly. So originally it would have been a black and white image, but Warhol printed very saturated and really garish colors over it. Um, and these colors are meant to evoke similar colors used in comic strips. So this whole image of Marilyn was not meant to reflect her at her finest, right? Like we're looking at, you know, highly pigmented hair and skin and really dark ruby red lips and blue eyeshadow and all of these really awful colors that are found in comic books and are not these delicate rose rosy cheeks found in you know leonardo's angels or something like that or you know earlier works or even the colors found in abstract expressionism uh these are definitely overt and they're meant to be in your face uh something to remember is that this piece was created shortly after marilyn died and many historians believe it's meant to be representative of an icon so early icons such as like you know when you say Byzantine icons kind of from this, this medieval period, uh, the Middle Ages, however you want to describe it, icons were depicting, you know, really religious spiritual figures. So icons in Byzantine art also, you know, they featured the Virgin Mary and the Christ child, usually situated around a gilded background. And so we can't ignore that Andy is definitely looking at icon imagery here, especially with the gilded or especially with the gold paint. Whenever an artist, it doesn't matter, whenever an artist tries to employ some type of gold or gilded in their work, and it features primarily as the background, that's going to always, and it should always trigger, this is looking like a Byzantine style painting. You know, this is looking like they're looking at this and they're inspired by these things because it was so big of a deal back, you know, you know hundreds of years ago thousand thousand years ago and so he's definitely looking back um, at what these icons were doing so warhol is really making a religious statement right he's making a statement and it's a bold one that marilyn monroe was like the virgin mary of his time in american culture which goes along the lines of his other works and interests so by saying that marilyn is the Virgin Mary of his time, we're meaning her fame, her notoriety, you know, her overt femininity. Uh, we're looking, she, he's comparing Marilyn Monroe to the mother of Jesus Christ and said, look, this is, this is pretty much what we've done to her. You know, we've, we've made her into this borderline religious figure that he was saying she was worshiped. Yes. Yeah, very much so. She was worshiped, but she also had these expectations of how to behave too you know uh because we know that the virgin mary and theologians when they wrote about her said oh mary behaved like this and she was modest and she was humble you know and 
those same kind of standards, these religious, you know, standards were put onto Marilyn Monroe that you were supposed to behave a certain way. So this is really part of Warhol's brilliance. He's not necessarily thinking about the history of art, but he desires to relate to the culture perceived now. So he's he is looking back and saying, these are similar cultural ideas and concepts, except I can put them into what we're doing today. And he's making a commentary that people to their very core really don't change. No matter how, many, how much time happens, we're still, we're still acclimated to worship. We're still acclimated to serve, to do things for something, a greater cause than just ourselves, mostly. Uh, now that's starting to shift in our cultural landscape, but that's for another time. Also, understand that Warhol is no longer painting. Painting no longer symbolizes the larger culture of mass production and marketing. He's more interested in media such as prints because they can be mass produced by numerous assistants. So it's pretty much his idea and now they can be mass produced, right? It's his design, but he can pump out hundreds and hundreds of prints if he wants to. So he's not interested in individually painting or sculpting anything anymore. So Warhol is not concerned with the classical traditions associated with painting and sculpture. Fundamentally, his art not only provides a commentary for contemporary American culture, but also an aggressive accusation of Western culture as we know it. So he is definitely critiquing uh, what our culture is doing in their consumerism, right? And that they're trying to consume all of these things uh, instead of interacting with them. So Marilyn thus stands as a contemporary pop icon meant to offend others who don't consider such works art. So he wants somebody to come up and say like, well, this isn't art and I don't agree with it. That's kind of the expectation. That's what he wants. He wants that conversation of like, well, is it or is it not? And do you get to decide what is or is not? And why do you get to decide? Um, pop artists wanted to create something intentionally ugly where people would respond with criticism. They were kind of drama queens and they enjoyed the drama. Uh, they were working against fundamental ideas developed by abstract expressionists. These pop artists believed that you could put a soaked rag on a wall and it would be called art because of abstract expressionism's earlier movement. So they were also intentionally critiquing the process behind abstract expressionism. And, you know, I don't know if anybody has ever watched uh, videos of when Jackson Pollock would paint, but he would just drip color kind of onto a canvas because it was all about a process and you know that process was inspired by a lot of sand painting in native in ancient native american culture and so uh they were critiquing that they were saying well you're telling me that in this abstract expressionism that i can take a rag soaked in paint and i can you know throw it on with different colors and that's going to be art but i can't put a picture of marilyn monroe and that's considered art so he was kind of critiquing this hypocrisy surrounding the fine art world and who actually gets to judge that which is i think is funny so they essentially wanted to experiment to see if people would actually call what they were doing art and a lot of it was one big joke and i say ish because there were serious critiques in it but they also had a relatively good sense of humor so to end with Marilyn, we don't actually have her face, but we have her mask. And this was never a face presented to the world. And the real one was something that we were never meant to see. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more below. So moving on to Marilyn Diptychs. This is another really famous work by Warhol. The Marilyn Diptych is made of two silver screens, which Warhol printed Marilyn's face 50 times. The work explicitly references early religious diptychs popular in the Byzantine and Renaissance periods. So we know for a fact that Andy is looking at earlier periods and earlier art movements um, to gain kind of this inspiration and he's using and he's using those similar concepts and refiguring them to fit his current cultural concepts, right? His current culture and society. So uh, diptychs were obviously there were two panels and they usually featured um a husband and wife they usually featured you know jesus and mary um they usually featured fe fe featured two individuals right um they were very popular for marriage portraits as well so therefore marilyn much like before is evocative of a religious fixture figure um or at least a historical figure um and nearly held to the same social status so warhol is inviting viewers to worship her much like they worshiped religious figures as the Virgin Mary or the Christ child. 
or even certain figures such as um, Isaiah or certain prophets. You know, there were a lot of, there was a lot of, you know, not necessarily image worship, but they, it was, these images inspired them to worship certain figures. So we've gone over that Warhol was concerned with contemporary life, and he was, but something to consider and ask ourselves is, can we actually divorce ourselves from history or art history? So we know that Andy is fighting against this idea of individualism, and he's saying, I can do what I want, um, but there are a lot of people that actually consider like, no, you can create something new without actually having to work with what's already been done. Um, which of course I'm staunchly opposed to that because everything that we do is just reconfigured in our current society. Um, we like to think that we're being individualistic, but for the most part, uh, nothing's different. Um, so there is this, there is this idea and there's this debate among historians and scholars, can something actually be individual can something actually be new particularly in the art world um we've gone over michelangelo in the renaissance and it's important to understand that artists throughout history and even today build on work that's been done before uh, michelangelo did the same thing he looked back to ancient artists he looked back to his contemporaries he looked back to his to artists that worked in the byzantine style um so warhol with his sweeping colors and forms is channeling the ideas of abstract expressionism here, but only to poke fun at them. Um, so he's saying that he can make masterpieces too with the same concept of form and color that doesn't allow the viewer to focus on just one point, right? He's trying to undermine their earlier works, claiming that they really aren't that monumental. They're really not as original as the abstract expressionist artists like to think. He said, look, I can do the same thing. I can do it where somebody has to intentionally, their eye has to move across this canvas. Their eye has to move across this picture. Um, I can incorporate color. I can incorporate lack of color. I can incorporate details. I can incorporate lack of detail. Um, everything that these <laughs> abstract expressionists did, and it was essentially making fun of and saying like, no, I can do it. And I can do it in a completely new style that you haven't even thought of. So Warhol really is an exceptional artist and could have easily created his own Im image of Marilyn. But instead he appropriated a mass image printed in newspapers and magazines because this went with his whole idea of consumerism and what we think is true and relativism and all these big ideologies. So Marilyn already looks a bit unrelatable as if no true emotion stems from her face with the heavy eyes and parted lips. Um, and we kind of see that, we see her that she doesn't really look like a, like a real person anymore. And we, it's this concept of this mask that she wore for her consumers. So switching kind of making fun of abstract expressionism, we'll talk specifically about this piece of Marilyn. So Warhol's take, Warhol takes this mask of Marilyn and flattens her emotions even more through the silkscreen process. Um, so he, and he does it through the flatness of it and through the colors or lack of color too. Warhol is essentially taking a physical flatness of the image and creating an emotional flatness through color and lack thereof. And this is really, this is really working as a commentary on a manufactured star with a fake name being merely one dimensional and being just really a one dimensional sex symbol, right? And it's not the most appropriate context, context for religious devotion. These images are printed. There is no painting involved except for the covering of canvas and ink. Thus Warhol is detached from the emotional attachment to his work, choosing to explore an automatic style of mass production. So that even takes the process of work and flattens it even more. However, Warhol is attached to the actual canvas itself as an object because he's obviously objectifying Marilyn Monroe. So through his execution, so see Warhol is working in, you know, in ambiguities here. Um, Warhol through his execution creates a symmetry between artist and subject who each seem to be less than fully human. So it's a commentary not only on Marilyn, but it's also a commentary on Warhol himself. The artist has now become a machine just as Marilyn has become only a mask or a shell. So some art historians believe the garish tonal qualities give the faces qual a quality of embalming while the black and white images evoke vanishing. So obviously this has a lot to do with her death. Um, Warhol is working alongside the idea that we can easily become desensitized to images that we see, just like Marilyn's mask. Instead, we just see a flat picture of a person rather than the person itself. 
And so to end this conversation, uh, we ended it with a couple minutes to spare. Um, so the real questions are, how do we feel about Warhol's work? If we would really consider it art, if not, how would we define it? Do you believe Andy is original? And how do you feel about pop art? And so if we want to answer these questions, we can. If you guys just want to take it and consider it, um, that's fine too. So I'm going to open it up for some discussion if you want. And if nobody really pops in in the next you know, a couple seconds, then we will end our time. Uh, you also can feel free to ask me questions and I will try to answer them the best I can. So. I think he was crazy like a fox. <laughs> He's so smart. He is, he is. And that's the thing is like, there's always a new layer, you know, it's like, how does one mind really consider all this? And, and maybe some of it is like, well, are art historians putting this in, you know, were some of these things subconscious and he wasn't actually thinking about them, but there's always seems to be an extra layer with his work. I think his chim chiming into the marketing piece is a uh, very different, I mean, it's, it's crucial the time period they were in, but, uh, you know, most artists at that time were producing one, prior to that were producing one object at a time, or maybe they may be doing multiple paintings, but the mass production where he could take his art and, you know, make multiple prints and sell multiple prints. And all of a sudden he's economized his work at a different level than, than what a lot of others were doing. Yeah, and, and that's really kind of what set him apart from this kind of individualistic genius, right? That you had to create art a certain way in order to be successful in the art world, but you were always an outlier, right? It was always this, you know, you were really, fine art was only consumed by the upper echelons of society and Andy created something that everybody could essentially consume because of his mass marketing practices. And he did give the option, right? He would, he commissioned himself. So these people in, you know, these high society, these celebrities or these various stars, whoever was really popular could come in and say, oh, I want you to do this. And he'd say, okay, fine. You know, and then he'd say, it's 25,000 bucks and I will do whatever you want. Um, so he really did market himself, but to everyone in a very real sense. When I think about pop art from back then, because I was around for it, um, I also think of Peter Max. He, he was awesome. He was around the same time mm -hmm. and so colorful. Would you think that um, anime is kind of uh, the, the contemporary uh, pop art nowadays? I think it has a lot to do. I mean, I think it, it has a lot in common with kind of what pop art was back then uh, because it gets a lot of hate from the fine art world. And, and so I like it, you know, and I think there are going to be more and more exhibitions of people working in anime. Um, and I think they're questioning the same thing of like, well, do you actually get to call what I create art or not? Um, which, you know, I, I was a Renaissance art historian and that's where really my bread and butter is. But these questioning kind of the status quo, there are certain you know, movements that I really do enjoy. And pop art just happens to be one of them, kind of questioning this overall snobbery that we have of the art world, that art is really meant for everyone to try to consume and, and be a part of because it's a visual representation of the culture that we live in. Um, so I don't know that I would consider it necessarily the pop art of our, of our time, but I do think they are tackling on the same questions that Andy himself was asking. I think he would like it. <laughs> oh, I think he would love it. I think, I think he would love to know what we're doing on social media right now. I think, he would, <laughs> I think he'd have a lot of fun things to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is pretty much all the time we have, um, which good, we ended and, you know, nobody will yell at me for <laughs> going over. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know that um, I did and I hope you, so next, next time we meet together, we're learning about a regional artist, an artist that she resides in Fayetteville and she's actually in our exhibition right now. Her name is Robin Horn and she's, ex she's exhibited aside, or beside her sister and her mother. And so we're gonna learn about her. So she's a contemporary and a regional artist. 
And then after her, we'll be shifting back to the Renaissance. So we hope that you join us. Thank you all. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.